our first step towards understanding and proving Lagrange's theorem that says that the order of any subgroup of a finite group is a divisor of the order of the whole group itself will be to understand how to take a subgroup and sort of move it around within its parent group in a specific way. We're going to move the subgroup around in its parent group by acting upon it on the left or the right by multiplying it by elements from that group. And to understand how that works in a, in a broader context that's not just as simple as the cyclic case that we saw in the introduction. We were able to move this subgroup 0369 down to the next row by adding one, and then to the next row after that by adding one more. And then we could know for sure that when I added one more, I would get back to the original subgroup. What does that look like in the more general setting of a finite group that's not necessarily cyclic or even abelian? That's what we're doing in this video, understanding how left and right actions and inner automorphisms induced by elements of G act upon subgroups of G. So we're going to look first by way of example at three different ways of moving a subgroup H around inside of a group G by multiplying by an element of G. For our motivating example, we're going to take the group A4, the alternating group on four symbols. These are the even permutations of four elements. And the subgroup inside of it, which is the cyclic subgroup generated by the three cycle 1, 2, 3. That's a subgroup that has three elements, the identity 1, 2, 3, and its inverse 1, 3, 2. So we want to look at how to move that subgroup around inside of A4 in several different ways. This is a subgroup of order 3. If the analogy that I'm making here is the same as the analogy to the cyclic subgroup that we saw a second ago, then what we expect to see is that the cosets, the result of moving this around inside the group, are going to partition the group and are all going to have three elements also. If that's true, and if that's true for any group at all, then that must mean that Lagrange's theorem is true. All right, so for example, let's suppose that I take this subgroup H and I apply a left action on the elements of H by an element outside of H, by the element 1, 2, 4. What am I going to get, in other words, if I multiply all of the elements in this subgroup on the left by the 3 cycle 1, 2, 4? So here's my nifty little tool for doing that. Um, this little app is going to give me the ability to either left multiply all of the elements in this subgroup by something, or apply a right action, which is to multiply by the inverse of those elements on the right side, um, or do a combination of both. Those are going to be the three different ways that we're going to talk about in this video to move a subgroup around to different places inside of its parent group. So in our first example, we wanted to know what happens when I apply a left action by the element 1, 2, 4 to this subgroup H. That just means I want to multiply every element in H by 1, 2, 4 on the left. When I do that, the elements in that, what I'm now going to call a left coset, those elements are 1, 2, 4 times the identity, 1, 2, 4 times 1, 2, 3, and 1, 2, 4 times 1, 3, 2. So it's these three elements right there. So let's just keep score. 1, 2, 4 multiplied by H, left multiplying all these elements by 1, 2, 4, gives me now a new set of elements. I'm going to call that the left action of 1, 2, 4 on the subgroup H. And the elements that we get in this process, as we saw in the app a second ago, are 1, 2, 4, 1, 4, 2, 3, and 1, 3, 4. What you'll notice about this left action applied to H is it still has three distinct elements, and also that none of those three elements were one of the elements of H. So this purple subgroup and this orange left coset are disjoint from one another. So I'm getting three new elements through this process. Does that always happen? Let's try applying a left action by another element, say 1, 3, 2, 4, acting on the left of H. What happens there? So again, to visualize what's happening here, I'm just going to select the left multiplication, the left action, by 1, 3, 2, 4 on the subgroup H. It's going to have its elements 1, 3, 2, 4 times identity, 1, 3, 2, 4 times 1, 2, 3, and 1, 3, 2, 4 times 1, 3, 2. That gives me these three elements here. This product of disjoint two cycles, 1, 3, 2, 4, coming from 1, 3, 2, 4 times identity, and then also 1, 4, 2, and 2, 3, 4. So when I fill those in, in my chart, what you'll notice is that again, we've gotten three distinct elements in this left coset, and these are three different elements than we saw in the first two rows. So I haven't repeated any elements yet. 
at all. These don't overlap one with another, and that's an important observation. All right, so there's a couple examples of multiplication on the left. What about multiplication on the right instead? So for example, if I wanted to multiply on the right by 1, 2, 4, instead of on the left by 1, 2, 4, if my group were abelian, if the commutative property were satisfied by its operation, then there would be no difference between right multiplying by this element and left multiplying by this element. So I would end up getting the same row here by right multiplying by 1, 2, 4, instead of left multiplying by 1, 2, 4. But we know that the alternating group on four symbols, for example, is not abelian. And so probably we're going to get a different result in this right action than we had in the left action. Let's see if that actually is borne out. If I multiply each of the elements of h on the right by 1, 2, 4, that's the same as applying a right action by really the inverse of 1, 2, 4. Remember, the right action function, as we saw a couple of videos ago, at when it acts on a, a, an element of a group, it acts by right multiplication by the inverse. So if we want to frame this discussion in terms of right actions, we should think of it as the right action of the inverse of 1, 2, 4. So it's the right action of 1, 4, 2, if you like. So in my app, then, let's see what we get. I'm going to apply the right action by the inverse of 1, 4, 2. That's going to give me the right multiplication by 1, 2, 4. That gives me these three elements right here, 1, 3, 2, 4, 1, 2, 4, and 2, 4, 3. And what you notice is that it's not the same, it's not an equal uh, coset to what we got when we did the left action by 1, 2, 4. So order definitely matters when we're talking about cosets. It matters because, after all, A4 is not an abelian group. Same thing with the right action by 1, 3, 2, 4. Uh, if we apply 1, 3, 2, 4, multiplying on the right of each of the elements of my group G, then the result there, 1, 3, 2, 4, 1, 2, 4, 2, 4, 3, is different than what we got left multiplying those elements. But it's not different, it turns out, than what we got by right multiplying by 1, 2, 4. So something different has happened here, that the right coset of 1, 3, 2, 4 ends up being exactly the same as the right coset of 1, 2, 4. So this row is on the nose the same thing as the row that came before it. That's another important observation, that we don't always get different cosets by multiplying by different elements. In fact, if we roll the tape back for a second, we might see why we might expect these two cosets to be the same, because 1, 3, 2, 4 happened to be one of the elements that was already in the coset of 1, 2, 4, the right coset of 1, 2, 4. So, so far, we've seen that there are kind of two options for cosets that show up. One option is that two cosets are completely distinct one from another. We have no overlaps between the two rows. The other option that just happened is that two cosets, if they do overlap, they overlap completely. And as we'll see a few videos from now, that is a key feature of cosets. They are always either identical to one another or completely disjoint from one another. There's no way for two cosets to overlap just partially. They either overlap completely or they overlap not at all. And that's going to be the reason why cosets partition a group, and therefore there's an equivalence relation that can tell us when two elements belong to the same coset. So anyway, there's some examples of left cosets and right cosets of this subgroup inside of A4. What's the third way to move a subgroup around? As we saw a couple videos ago, the third way is to combine the left and right actions by the same element. In other words, to take and multiply on the left and the right by an element and its own inverse. Before we go there, let me ask the question, what belongs in this last row, this last missing row in A4? Can we realize it also as a left coset of this subgroup? And I claim the answer is yes, and to find it, I'm just going to find an element of A4 which is not already represented in my chart, so 1, 4, 3, for example, and I'm going to claim to you that if it's true that different cosets either are disjoint or identical, that must mean that if 1, 4, 3 doesn't already belong to one of these, then what remains is going to be its own left coset. Let's just verify that. When I multiply on the left by 1, 4, 3, the elements of H, we get all remaining elements of A4, and sure enough, left multiplication of this subgroup by 1, 4, 3 
gives me 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 4, 3, and 2, 4, 3, exactly those three elements which are so far missing from my left cosets here. So, left multiplication by 1, 4, 3 accounts for elements 10, 11, and 12, if you like, of A4. And so we've seen now that these left cosets, the left coset by 1, 2, 4, by 1, 3, 2, 4, and by 1, 4, 3, those left cosets partition the whole group A4 into pieces that all have three elements in them. So, what we can say, then, is that the index of the subgroup H inside of A4, how many cosets does it have in A4, that index is equal to 4. So we'll say that the index in A4 of the subgroup H is 4. This table shows every element of the group A4 falling into one of three columns indexed by the elements of H, and one of four cosets indexed by the index of H inside of A4. So here's some things to observe before we talk about this last way of moving elements around. First, every element of A4 appears in one and only one place. Every element is accounted for once inside of this uh, diagram, and it's not accounted for more than once. No two rows share any elements in common. And also that every row has exactly as many elements as every other row. In particular, every coset has exactly as many elements in it as the subgroup of which it is a coset. And those observations that hold in this case are those that, if we can prove them in general, will prove that any finite group has, or a subgroup of any finite group has an order which is a divisor of the order of the group. And so our observation that these rows all have the same number of elements and that they partition the group, that is our key to proving Lagrange's theorem. And among these, the only row here that is a subgroup of G is the original row H, which was a subgroup. So when we use the word cosets to describe these other three rows, remember that cosets are almost never subgroups. They're only subgroups if they happen to contain, for example, the identity element. And since that identity element can only appear in one spot on this chart, we claim, that means that only that first row, the subgroup H, is going to be a subgroup. All the other cosets are not subgroups. We can think of them as translated subgroups, a copy of a subgroup that has been moved to a different spot inside of the parent group. All right, let's look at this last way of moving a subgroup around. By multiplying it on the left by an element and on the right by the inverse of that element, by combining the left and right actions together. What we're doing there is we're applying a function that a couple of videos ago we called an inner automorphism. A acts by conjugation on the elements of H. We proved back then that this construction always produces an isomorphism of H onto itself. And because it's an isomorphism of H onto itself, we know that the image of any subgroup under an isomorphism will remain a subgroup after we apply that function. And so if I apply an inner automorphism by 1, 2, 4 to this subgroup H, the result that I get is guaranteed to be a subgroup. So we're going to call this the conjugate subgroup associated with H uh, and the element 1, 2, 4. So what is that subgroup. I act on the left by 1, 2, 4. Notice that my subgroup is no longer a subgroup when I just use the left action. But when I combine that left action with the right action by the same element, now look at what I get. I get the identity, I get 2, 3, 4, and I get 2, 4, 3. That is a subgroup. It happens to be the subgroup generated by the element 2, 3, 4, the 3 cycle 2, 3, 4. That's a subgroup of A4 after all. So this conjugation action, the action of an inner automorphism induced by an element, always carries a subgroup onto a subgroup. It might be the same subgroup, it might be a different subgroup, but it will always be a subgroup in ways that cosets cannot in general be a subgroup. So what have we done in this video? We've looked at three different ways of moving a subgroup around inside of its parent group. When I move it by a left action, chances are I'm moving it to something which is no longer a subgroup. Same thing with right action. I'm probably moving it onto something which is not a subgroup anymore. If I combine those two actions induced by the same element together, I get an inner automorphism that turns out to be a subgroup called the conjugate subgroup associated with that element. And why this is going to matter on our road towards proving Lagrange's theorem is that these left cosets, for example, 
appear as though they partition the group G into rows, if you like, cosets, that have an equal number of elements in each of them. And also that this conjugate subgroup remains a subgroup. So these are two really important observations along the road to proving Lagrange's theorem. In the next video, let's take a look at actually proving some of the claims that I've made in this one in a more general setting. Get away from A4 into the, into the general case of any finite group. Why are these claims that I'm making about cosets and subgroups actually true in general?